Well, Ray, thank you very much for coming up with the idea to look at collecting seeds, which is, of course, an activity uh, that here at Route 66 Prairie uh, we've been doing for a long time. We share seed, we get seed from others, and the reason is, of course, that Route 66 Prairie uh, is a fairly recent venture, and while there's a lot of original high-quality prairie in spots, uh, a lot of it over the years, and even more recently, has gotten severely hammered by various activities, so we need to repair up to. So there are many reasons why we collect seed. And I just wrote down a few notes, since I have a bit of a tendency to ramble anyway. Uh, and uh, basically, I think what we'll do today is share a few tidbits of seed collecting. Uh, they, uh, many uh, publications, even books, have been written about the um, fascinating world, what I call the fascinating world of seed collecting, because it really is. And so I, I really thank you for coming up with this subject, very timely. Why do we do it? Uh, do it? Uh, first of all, there are no uh, truly pristine remnants of prairie left, even though you know, in Illinois we have 22 million acres of prairie, million acres of prairie, uh, except for a few spots in northern Illinois, there really isn't anything left that resembles the original prairie. It has just all sorts of traumatic experiences. So we need to upgrade the already damaged remnants, and this would be one of those. And then also we need to establish new sites, uh, whether that's for uh, grassland prairie or whether it's for woodland, uh, for wetlands. And this is a combination grassland prairie, just another name for it, um, and uh, uh, wetlands. This is wet prairie in many locations, uh, even if we go out here today. I don't think you'd find surface water today, but we'd find some pretty wet spots because we've had good growing uh, weather this year. So this is really uh, um, um, a combination of all these different areas. Even we have some woodland species. They're mostly just shrub species and a couple of small trees like crab apple, prairie crab, it's actually called. American plum, Chickasaw plum. So it, it, it's, it's really a complex world, and that's what we collect for. Certainly we do it here. And um, uh, we're fortunate that we have this. We actually have something like 200 plus species of plants on this site already. And uh, the large percentage of those were here, but often in very small numbers. So we're trying to enhance it, but even this a uh, 10 acre site has differences in soil and water retention, just other subtle features that make plants grow well in one location and not another. We don't always know what will grow well where. So if we do collect, we're still wasting a lot of seed. It's just, it's just, that's just the way it is. Plus we have other issues um, like competition for the seeds, whether it's voles in the winter time, uh, our goldfinches that all of a sudden discover our gold, our, our wonderful sunflowers, just an annual sunflower, it's really a prairie weed in some way, but it's still a very nice plant, and uh, uh, so we do have competition also for collection. Well, seed collection season uh, is primarily in late summer and fall, because that's when a lot of the things that we even see now in the asters and the golden rods that are shortly coming into bloom, uh, they will be ripe. But even some earlier species, and we might find a few of those, uh, are not ripe now. Uh, even though they've been blooming, have been out of bloom for many months since April, May. So there's just a huge world of differences out there. Well, what else? Yeah, the season starts really from April for some early species. It actually goes into early winter. It's an amazing long season, and uh, we we tend we tend to under collect uh, whole categories. We tend to under collect the early species. Uh, a lot of them are not the easiest ones to collect. We under collect. We over collect the real showy stuff, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just a fact of life. And the ones that are less showy, we tend to ignore. 
But the, the less showy species, sometimes like grasses and what they call graminoids, the little things, it's been said that the little things really are the fabric of life. In some ways that's true in the prairie too. So they are more important than we often realize. We should collect for those too. Well, um, we'll just focus a little bit on what we find here now. Uh, when I collect for seed, usually I know where they are. But in some cases, I actually will put flagging on those. If I find a nice population, I will mark it. So when I go back later on, especially early season species, but they tend to be short. Well, nothing is short right now. So those things are almost impossible to find unless you mark them. You can be within five and 10 feet of something and you can't see it literally. You can't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. So scouting is important, marking them. And then of course comes the harvest. Then comes the processing, the storing. And, should we, and then the question, should we store seed or not? Uh, for commercial purposes, for large-scale restoration, uh, it's probably uh, uh, something you can't avoid. Generally speaking, I like to get the seeds out soon after I collect them, if it's at all possible. Uh, I usually make mixes uh, each period of the year that are appropriate for wet prairie, uh, the appropriate uh, for restoring damaged areas like along the uh, uh, concrete here. And that's coming along rather nicely, just looking at the color out here. So there are all sorts of reasons why we collect, what we collect for, and also we learn by doing uh, we also learn from others. It's been said that we stand on the shoulders of, uh, of others, of giants, uh, truly, and that's, that certainly is the case. Uh, and we can certainly learn also by doing a little bit of homework, studying, looking uh, at books and examples of what others have done. Uh, I think learning from our own mistakes is something we always do, but I like to avoid it because it can also be embarrassing. And it's unproductive. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, let's look at a, a few examples. Some seeds are really easy to collect. Uh, they occur in quantity. Uh, here's one of those. It's an unusual late flower, actually, because we've had such a wonderful growing season. But here's a beautiful prairie clover. and. Uh, has nice aromatic foliage and seeds, by the way. I love to co collect it just for the seed <laughs> fragrance. And you can just collect it right, rub it off, and put it in your hand, and there it is. It's altogether ready to sow. Needs no further processing. How fortunate can you be? So this is Prairie Crover. I'm gonna just scatter it right here into the um, uh, somewhat less favorable plant. This is. Ragweed, Ambrosia, Artemisiifolia, but uh, it's also nature's wound dressing where you have damaged area. Those annuals, and that's a native by the way, comes in. Then you run into seeds that are not so easy to collect. Of course, here's one that's already fully ripe, and I'll just rip it. And here we have what's left of Black Eyed Susan. That's done very well this year. And here are the seeds sit in this tight little head and usually it's best to take the whole thing, take it home, maybe run the seed heads through a, uh, even run it through a hammer mill because they're really a little hard to get out sometimes. Uh, we have a lot of those that need processing and I mentioned that. So this is one that would need processing. But it can be done commercially, it can be grown in large quantities, it's easy. Then we have things that we don't collect so much. And here's a real iconic prairie grass, a, a southern species. This one right here, and this is just a fresh seed head right there. This is eastern gamma grass. Some consider it uh, the closest relative for corn. Whether that's the case or not, I don't know, but it is unique in that the seed is stacked. Single stack seeds. And that is tough to collect. This isn't ripe enough. This is all gone for one 
seed that's left here. Two. There's actually two seeds here. And I, I just busted them out. Well, yeah, there it is. There it is. But that's a poor harvest if you need quantities. Now here it is in the intermediate stage. And interestingly enough, it does come apart. And when it comes apart, those are ripe enough, but they will need drying. If you look at them, they're green, they're not uh, pale like these, they need drying. So if you have these in large quantities and you wouldn't dry them properly, they would mold on you. Uh, again, let's save those seeds. These in here, if you have a little stem attached and you put them in a shaded area, they, they're solid, so they might mature, uh, or you might call it after ripen in storage. This one for sure. This one on the end here, yeah, it would probably ripen also. Okay, eastern gamma grass. A little harder to, control, uh, to, to, to collect, but very feasible. Then we have some grasses, and again, grasses are the little things that run the world, so to speak. Uh, this is one, another southern species, and I, I like to stress that a little bit because we are on the southern, uh, southern till plain, uh, and we have some unique species that you will not find up north in Chicago or Michigan or uh, Minnesota, and uh, so that makes it unique. This is called a bead grass, Pospalum. This is one of the Pospalums, and it's actually in flower because I can see the black. Uh, you can see the, that would be nice, this would be nice to do some microphotography on, right? You can see the yellow pollen, barely, and you can see the dark black purple stigma on this one. I hadn't really paid attention to that. Kind of nice. But what's interesting about this, these beet grasses, and I have two different kinds here. We have, I think, three different species here. but. I brought this one here. I'll just rip this one out here. And this one is also a Pospalum beet grass, but they ripen within days. They usually ripen within days. Well, this one looks, yeah, there it is. They ripen within days. So if you're not on top of it, this is another uh, plant, prairie plant. This beet grass, Pospalum ciliatofolium, I think it is. Um, anyway, it's it's a difficult difficult genius for me, but I'm fascinated by it. But it is part of our matrix, and we should collect those because diversity is so important. But here again is the seed, and if you don't continuously go back to a patch and and check those wispy seeds heads. Right there, you see how wispy that is. Yeah, it's lost some seed apparently. But anyway, it's just it's just an example uh, how varied and complex that is. We'll walk along here a little bit and uh, see if we find some interest. Here's the blazing star still in bloom. When they're out of bloom and they fluff out, they're also real easy to uh, harvest. Uh, you can just strip them off and you can fill a gunny sack collecting back in a hurry. And it's a very good prairie plant. And of course, collecting it and getting it going are two entirely different stories. That one, and that has to be part of a picture when you talk about collecting something. Do you really want to bother if you can't get it going? We should have a lot of it, but we have an isolated 10 acre prairie that's overrun with voles. We do have snakes that eat voles, but they can't keep up. Uh, we have, I, think, I, think five, I think I've found five or six different species of snakes out here. Not that many, not that often, uh, but they don't have enough uh, predators. So they, they get out of hand. They eat all of the uh, Liatris tubers. The reason they survived here is because there's rock there and they can't uh, quite make it in the rock. This is one of those late season uh, plants. Uh, it's later on, it's quite easy to collect. It, it has fluffy dandelion type seeds. 
and uh, it's one of our native thistles here, by the way. All our native thistles have a white underside. They're also not nearly as spiny as the uh, introduced bull thistle. That's one of our agricultural weeds. So it's, it's quite easy to tell. But what's important about it and why it should be collected uh, is um, it's not that it's not only a part of the prairie matrix, but it's a wonderful pollinator plant. And uh, we are putting a stress today on um, uh, providing habitat uh, for, for our uh, uh, pollinators, which in many cases are somewhat, uh, you know, threatened and danger. Here's, here's some more. You go along, it's not everywhere. And I would go ahead and, and I would just collect the uh, purple prairie clover here. And I would uh, take it home and use it in probably a dry prairie mix. I would use that in a dry mesic prairie mix. Here I'm scattering it because this is a good place to put it. Surprisingly, uh, in strong late bloom are the mountain mints, and they're a very important part the seed, and it's widely collected. This is one of three different species of mountain mint we have here. Uh, doesn't look much as a little example there the whole plant looks much nicer. But again, it's really way past season. It's just we have a wonderful growing season. So we should come with lots of seed. But that little seed sits in these little individual receptacles down here. And uh, you have to work it out, shake it out. You'd come up with a lot of seed. But again, this species and others like it take a little bit more time to process. That's true for the um, distantly related uh, bergamot, um, what's the other name, uh, Monarda, nice purple flowers, and they too have the seed in these little tubes, and you have to work on it. Both of these have a delightful aroma. One of the delights of um, getting seed. Now, most of these are permanent plants, but then we have some that are annuals. And here is an annual that was actually still not very common, but it's used lots, much in restoration. This little purplish thing here uh, is one of the ear, it's called Eared False Foxglove, Tomentera auriculata. Actually was on the endangered species list for, for quite a long time. And then uh, it's been introduced to a lot of sites it comes seeds from seed. It's an annual. So we don't very often collect annuals, although maybe this one a little bit more often. So the uh, Tomentera, uh, the other related uh, Agalina species. Help me with a common <laughs> Can't think of it. Anyway, not false, false fox love? Yeah, false fox love. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we have uh, two other species here, and again, those are annuals, and so I like to collect those heavily because they, collect, they make for a lot of color when they bloom. And there are others that are in the same group that while they may not be normally very popular, uh, they collect a lot, they, 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 they create a lot of color. And, and again, those things are important. These have been collected, but here's one. And this is uh, Echinacea, one of our purple coneflowers. Uh, very spiny, which is what the Latin name Echinus, I think, means. Like a spiny anteater has Echinacea in the name. This is really spiny, you can feel it, I mean. And the seed sits down in there. Uh, and it's hard to get out, but the uh, goldfinches don't know that. And the goldfinches somehow, even though you don't see them around very often, they find these titbits and clean them up. So those you want to collect right away. And this might be one that's already lost all the seed. It's probably uh, some of the other seed-eating birds and the goldfinch being the major one. So this is, is one that you have to collect early. And I did, if you look at the stems here, the tips, I collected these early, took them home. And then I have to figure out a way to take these apart. Commercially with a hammer mill, uh, you can moisten these. 
uh, keep them wet for five days, like it went through a rain. Don't put them in the water, but just get them wet, take them back out again. Do the three or four times in a row, and you kind of mellow the scales. And then you can rub it out, and also when they're not um, dry, they're not so spiny. But even then, I usually wind up with a few boo-boos on my fingers that I have to later on pick out. So this just a tremendous amount of diversity. Uh, in harvesting and ripeness, this one here uh, is, is, is one of those that's intriguing because this bloomed in April, May. And here we are in the latter part of August and the seed is ripe, I think, yeah. But it's still sitting tightly in its capsule. Tightly, it has not opened up yet. It makes it easy to collect, but again, you have to be attuned to the fact, oh, once this was all white and pink with beard's tongue, and now, unless you know where it is, it's a little harder to find because it sits down here. So obviously you would want to collect this and you just, you know, with a knife or scissors, you rip them out, you put them in your seat collecting uh, bags, uh, buckets, and you take it home. And then you have to figure out a way of, of getting the seed out. And that's one, again, I don't have a hammer mill, but you can go like this. And if you look down here, look at all the seeds that have come out already, see? So, yeah, right there. So, that seed, again, we don't waste not want not. There, it's a good plant. Uh, you can just go along here, and it's just amazing how much, just from this one subject, you come up with. Um, we have a lot of milkweeds here, and this is one of the, um, this is the Sullivan's milkweed, one of our pretty ones. And certainly a butterfly uh, magnet, especially for monarch. And uh, this one is not ripe, uh, but it still demonstrates what it looks like already. Um, it's an interesting structure. The seed is tightly packed in here, and then it turns brown, and then they fluff out and form umbrellas, and then they fly on the wind. Uh, these are still in the milky stage. You see how sticky it is. And, uh, uh, but again, that seed, when it's ripe, if you catch it just right, you can actually work it out real easy. There's other ways of doing it. But that's how I do it. It's, it's got some weight to it. But it's not ripe, so I'm, I'm probably wasting it. But here it is. Another thing is interesting about the milkweeds that would be really subject uh, for another video. We think of those as monarch food, but our Native Americans, well, it was a very important food for them. Uh, in the early stages, they used it as an asparagus. Uh, the fruit, when it's young and immature, uh, it's a little bit like okra. Uh, with okra, you don't want to wait till it's fully ripe either, you know, but if you take okra, not everybody likes okra, I happen to like it. Anyway, you take it when it's tender, and uh, in this case, this is much bigger than an okra. It made a lot of uh, important uh, sustenance for Native Americans. We don't know that always. Anyway, here again is the liatris that's getting close. And again, I observe these things. And then I see something like this here, which we have enough off, but for a time, I collected this a lot. This is one of so-called graminoids, you know, one of the sedges. And uh, that seed is, is fully ripe. You can just see on my hand there how easy that comes out. So since we have a lot of wet prairie out here, uh, this is really also one of the one of the lesser collected but important species. So there's a ton of detail to seed collecting, and uh, uh, whether you do it in small quantities or large quantities, 
I oh this I would cut this uh, and again this if if I needed it there's a lot of black eye susan right there there's a plant there it's an annual and again annuals are important not just the showy ones like black eyed susan and there's just a ton of seed there so in the right location that's a wonderful plant to collect I don't do it anymore because we got lots of it and Thank you, and we ask the listeners to also make comments about what they would like to hear.